Hello everyone and welcome. We are here today with one of the elders of Allen Chapel Seventh-day Adventist Church and her name is Sister Alberta Graham. My name is Elizabeth Anderson and this interview is for African American Sabbath and what I want to ask you Elder Graham is some of your experiences that you've had growing up um, with racial discrimination and I'd like you to convey some of those experiences and tell us how that was for you growing up. Okay. Well, I suppose I could go back to when we were young <coughs> and traveling with our family, with my parents. <coughs> At that time, we uh, would have to carry our food along with us and I suppose that's the reason why a lot of our people like uh, fried chicken because <laughs> they can carry the chicken <laughs> along with them. And, uh, you know, um, because they knew that they could not stop and um, at a restaurant. It was uh, something that you didn't do. If you could, then they had a different door for you to go in like the back door as opposed to going um, to the front door and you have to buy it and take it out. You couldn't uh, go into their restaurants and, uh, and eat. So we always had to carry our food to be sure that we had something to eat. We also had to sleep in our cars. We'd pull in somewhere if, if it was a long trip and uh, you know, rest for about an hour or so because we knew that we uh, were not accepted at the hotels and motels. It would be nice if you if you knew uh, some friends along the way because then you could stop with them. But a lot of times you would be going places where you didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. You could get uh, stop and get gas, but uh, you couldn't use their restrooms. So <laughs> you'd have to go to the trees. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> yeah, oh my go goodness. to the trees for it's the lot and uh, you know for for relief. <laughs> but uh, that's what happened when we were were young and traveling. So, when you prepared for a trip. Did you kind of map out where you would be going and if there would be places that you could stop along the way or you would just prepare that there would be no places that you'd be able to stop? Well, when I was young, there were no places. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, now you can stop. But then when I was a child, no, no stopping. You could stop with friends if you knew some, some friends, but... Uh, if you were going to a place where you didn't know anyone, you know, you would have to just use your car for traveling and stopping and could get some food and take it out, but you couldn't go into a restaurant and eat. How was um, schooling back then for you? Well, schooling, see, because I was, I was born in the South, which is uh, Kentucky, which is, Kentucky is the gateway to the South. <clears throat> we had our own schools. Schools were not integrated. We had all uh, <coughs> black schools. Our principals, our teachers, all of our teachers were people of color. And we uh, had no problems there because everything was different and also we had our own doctors and, and nurses and professional people that we went to that uh, had their own business so we didn't have to, to try to go to other you know my principal was a person of color all of my teachers were and uh, when I was young that's the way it was did you um, know or ever hear about how schooling was in the white-only schools? Were they 
better? Were the conditions better? Do you know any of that information or you just knew the experience? You know, when I was young, you know, I really, uh, you know, they had their own schools and we had our own schools. Mm -hmm. And everything was separate. You know, they say separate and equal, but it, you know, it was never equal because our facilities were never like their facilities were. Right. Um, how was it as far as going to church? You, I think you mentioned to me that your father was a, a minister. Yes, yes he was. And so, of course, his congregation was probably all black. Yes, yes, yes. School, all schools, my schools were all uh, black. My um, churches that I attended, because my father was a pastor, and we uh, attended services from morning to night. <laughs> <laughs> Every service, they had five five services during Sundays, because I was a Sunday keeper. Okay. Yeah, at that time, yeah. So we attended all five services. We start with the the uh, Sunday school, and then the morning service then the afternoon service, and then the evening service. So all day long I was in church ever since uh, I was a kid. All I knew was church. Mm -hmm. I was raised in the church. So can you share with me um, one of your earliest experiences dealing with racial discrimination? When did you know that you weren't being treated or your family wasn't being treated, or, or your family's friends weren't being treated like white people. When was your earliest remembrance of that? I don't know. When you when you are born in the South, and you have you don't come in contact with very many uh, white people because you're in a community where. You raised, and all of your people are. You know, you're. You go to a doctor, and he's first of color. He's black, and uh, the schools were all black. Uh, and when you're young, you don't even think of that. Sure. Yeah, that's nothing that you think of. You just go where your parents send you, and that's it. But you know that there are other. Uh, schools around because you pass their schools to go to your school. Okay. So it's not integrated. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you realize that. But, uh, oh, I just, uh, you know, you're not really um, cognizant of that fact when you are growing up in, in your own neighborhood. All of your neighbors are people of color, you know, you, your schools, especially when you're in the South. I, I was born in the South, not the deep South there is. Uh, there was probably a lot more discrimination deep down there than it was where we were because in Kentucky you could ride the bus anywhere you wanted to, but in the lower South I was told that you could not because in fact my husband was saying that he was going down to Tennessee to uh, something and he uh, was riding the bus and they wanted him to go to the back of the bus to, 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 to have a seat to not sit up front. And he was young but he, he didn't want to do that. He said, why do I have to sit in the back when you have all those seats up up front, <laughs> right? Right. But we, he was told he had to sit in the back. He was very upset over that, all because he was not white. I'm so sure. That was a difference of so, so were black and where you grew up, black and white people could ride the bus together. Yeah, in the state that we were in, Kentucky. In Kentucky, mm -hmm. okay. But we, if you were to go to. Alabama, Mississippi, or wherever down there. No, you, you could not. You had to sit in the back. 
but in Kentucky you could ride the bus wherever you wanted to. Okay. Sit, you could sit wherever you, you wanted to. Um, can you tell me some experiences that you've had? You mentioned on the phone that you went to nursing school. Mm -hmm. um, could you share some uh, information about if you had any experiences that singled you out as a black person? <laughs> well, not very many because, uh, you know, being here, I was in Nebraska, living in Nebraska then, not in Kentucky. <clears throat> I went to college in Kentucky, but I went to a black college, all black. Okay. So I, uh, that's where I started going to, uh, to school, uh, out of uh, high school. I, about a year later, I went to uh, an all black college, so had no problems there. Uh, I didn't finish until I um, moved out to uh, Nebraska and finished school out, out, out here as opposed to down south. So I had no problems. Uh, you know, we usually there was one teacher <coughs> that uh, would give you a C when all of your other grades were A's and B's. I had really? that happen. Oh yeah for a, a course like, it was a community health course, the easiest course. I could understand had it been psychology or anatomy or something like that, but a very easy course. Mm -hmm. I was given a C and all my other grades were A's and B's. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and I knew that it, it wasn't. I was very upset and my, and my husband told me, don't, don't fret over it, you're, you're gonna make it n no matter. You know, but yeah, she gave me a C for no reason at all. For the easiest course. And you know, you have all those other difficult courses. And yes. Had all A's and B's for, for those, but she gave me that one C. But he told me, don't, don't sweat it. Just keep on going. Yeah, you're, you know, you're going to face uh, discrimination. You know, teachers asking you, are you sure this is what you want to do? I mean, when you are living in Nebraska, in Lincoln, and you are commuting every day to school, that doesn't sound like you, you don't want to go. <laughs> right. You know, that's 100 miles going every day to school, five, five days a week. I remember you telling me that on the phone. You said that for nursing school, you, you, came, you lived here in Lincoln, and you had to commute every day to Omaha. That's right. They didn't have a nursing school here in Lincoln. Okay. Yeah. So we had to go to Omaha to do it. And then to have your teacher to ask you, is this what you really want to do? You know, I was uh, married with four children and asking me, is this what you want to do? <laughs> uh, you know, my husband was real help in, in a helping because he would take care of, the, you know, I would have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to drive up there we had a carpool, there were several of us, they were white. I was the only person of color that, that went. And uh, <clears throat> then you uh, have to be in class by a certain time, you know, seven o'clock or eight o'clock or whatever. You couldn't be late. We, we, in fact, we would go up there some days and the people that lived in the city didn't even go to school because the weather was so bad. Oh really? But but you well, we traveled. Went, and that's right. We traveled. <laughs> that's right. We traveled and went up there. Mm -hmm. But um, because of a class, see, the first year I went, I think there were a couple hundred that they uh, put into that class. But after the first semester, there were only about eighty-four, and and me and another girl, we were the only black people in the class, one from Omaha and one from Lincoln. So all of my, you know, <laughs> classmates were all white. So we were the only two that graduated because we started out with a group of a- You were the only two that graduated? Yeah, that of a color. Of color, Because yes. the others, uh, 
they f that first uh, e semester, they try to make it difficult to see oh. whether you're going to make it. I see. And they, you know, just they just dropped out. Oh. Um, and we were the only two that really went all of the way. He stuck it out. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy because, uh, you know, we were the only st <laughs> only ones there. One from Omaha, one from Lincoln. I really don't know what happened to the girl from Lincoln, but we were the two that graduated in that class of 200 and some odd, and only 84 of us were, were left after they got through weeding everybody out. Wow. Mm -hmm. We were the only two left of color, but we, the Lord gave us strength, and I was the only one com commuting from Lincoln. At that time also, we were given an opportunity if we wanted to. Uh, the PA system was just being set up, and they gave us an option of uh, you know, transferring over to the PA uh, school. But because I had a husband and four kids, I couldn't do it. You know, he was uh, the only one working, and all of our children were in church school. <laughs> they were all in church school. That's right. They all got there. Education is, you know, we did what we could for them to have the proper, you know, training. And just like the, high, the prices are high now, they were high then. And when you have four of them in church school and only one person working. Yes, I cannot imagine yeah. <laughs> how stressful that must have been. That's right. And then when I started the school, my husband was the one that prepared the meals and got up and fixed the breakfast for the children and he was a real blessing in helping me to go. I couldn't have done it without him. And, uh, but I had a very unusual husband. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have, have those kind of men. They, they don't make them, oh, don't no, say that, that Sister Graham. <laughs> Every now and then, the Lord has one or two here or there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, he, he was unusual. He, he supported me in everything that I endeavored to do. And as a result, the Lord blessed me with positions from, the, from day one. I, I couldn't only get a, a through school fast enough. My first job was a supervisor of... A, Corrections out there at the Correctional Institute. I was the supervisor. The first, in fact, they went on TV to advertise for them. The governor went on there and said they were hiring for that position. I went and applied and ended up getting it. I got, <laughs> surprised me. <laughs> you know, God has been so good. Going, you kind of go, me? <laughs> you know, because you were, yeah. I applied for, they went on television, the governor did, and ended up hiring me as the first nursing supervisor out there. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was out there for six years. That's yeah. incredible. I decided to move on, but yeah, certainly did. I've had so many experiences. Um, you want to know about an experience of being, um, of discrimination? If you have any. Yeah. I do. Okay. <laughs> well, I do. Well, if I have it. Oh, you know, yeah, I do. Uh, in fact, uh, I was hired at, uh, the hospitals were separate then, Lincoln Journal and um, uh, Brian, you know, so they were separate hospitals. And I worked at Lincoln General. Uh, that's where I, f I uh, first started working there and ended up being a um, Supervisor of staffing and scheduling. I interviewed everybody that wanted a job, every nurse and every tech that wanted a job there. I had that job and then from, moved from that who had the Department of Discharge Planning. And I did that. When I, I say I, the Lord placed me in those positions. Yes. I really did nothing to deserve them, but God always gave me more work than I could ever do and uh, opened up doors that I never dreamed that where I would ever be. In fact, when I 
because I nursed here in, in Lincoln, but in, in Nebraska, but also in California. I did nurse, I retired from nursing out there. And I had a job out there in a beautiful office facing the San Bernardino Mountains, so beautiful. I was the only nurse in the, that department and led out in a clinic every, um, every week um, there. And I, uh, San Bernardino County is the largest county in the state. So I was given a van to go and, you know, to these other small towns to, to take care of business there. And uh, they would, they had their own place where you gas up. You know, I didn't have to spend any, anything. And besides that, I had a, a beautiful office there. And, and all of my people there were, well, my boss was a uh, black. He certainly was Dr. Gardner. He was a psychologist, and he was black. And uh, our office personnel uh, in the had a girl there who was black, and me was three of us, and then was a Latino also there in the office. So it was diversity. It's more diversity. In, California than it is in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> sure. As you already know. <laughs> it was. Yeah, so I uh, got that position there, and that's where I retired from. So I was never really on the floor. Uh, later on, I was I started out on the floor about a year working, you know, on the floor. But after that, I was always uh, in an office and doing, you know, other other things. God always gave me a, a, a good job. So you were promoted always. early. Yeah, yes, <laughs> did. And in fact, uh, when I got the job in California, I was living here in Nebraska. And I, uh, my husband went out there before me because he had an aunt out that lived out there and, and encouraged us to come out, say we could get work out there. So he went first to look for work. And while he was out there, I visited him. And we had a friend from Union College that was administrator of the hospital out there. Oh, wow. Gave me a tour and gave me a job. Before we even got there, I had a job. That's yeah. Incredible. And they want to know, well, when do you want to start? And I said, well, it was June. I said, well, I want to be there a month before I start. So they hired me without even seeing me. They hired me over the phone. And, uh, I, and then they said, well, we have some other in people that I have interviewed for the job, and we'll, we'll give you a call when, you know, we've, finished our interviewing. And so I said to myself, yeah, right, here I am sitting here in Nebraska, and they got all these nurses out, out there in California. Why would they hire somebody from Nebraska? Mm -hmm. They did. <laughs> I'm going, you, he called me to offer me the job, and I almost fell off my stretcher. <laughs> and then I didn't even know what I was going to be paid. <laughs> and, and I said, when we, before we, I uh, finish, uh, I said, well, maybe I should ask you uh, what the pay, uh, you know, is. He said, oh, yes, because uh, I was making 20000 back here a year. And he said, well, we offer you uh, uh, 32000 a year, and uh, in six months you'd be getting a raise. Uh, of 11 percent and of course it's five days a week no weekends and um, although it was a benefit package mm -hmm. in insurance and all that but you didn't have to that didn't come out of your pay and back here I was making 20 starting out there I'm making 32 it's pretty good <laughs> it was good it was good ended up before I, I left making 65 oh wow uh -huh. Cause I was there a while, so the Lord has always opened up doors that I never to have a job even before I got there. 
I had a job before we even moved. How could that be? You're right. That's that's God that's making right. a way. Yeah. When things happen, not the normal way, you know that it has to be God doing it for you. You know, he, he didn't. I have done nothing good to deserve the blessings from God. Nothing. And it puzzles me at times to wonder, you know, why? I, I, I don't deserve it, you know? <laughs> what is this all about? And that is one reason why in the positions where the Lord has placed me, I was humbled because I knew that he had done it and had put me there to be a light. Yes. I even had some of my clients to become Seventh-day Adventists oh, really? as a result of their association with, uh, with working with uh, me. God is good. I, I still don't know. I, all I can do is just thank him. And, you know, I, you know but that all of this strengthen, strengthens your faith in God when all of these things take place and unusual things so you know it's not normal, it's, it's not just something that you can, you know. <laughs> no, I know God has been good. And that makes your experience with Him strong and you know that He's taken care of, of you in the past and He's going to take care of you in the future. And you don't fret and worry when problems come. And they haven't always been smooth, you know, because I I was discriminated against in certain positions where I was. But the Lord always brought me through. In fact, the lady that wanted me out of the job that I had been placed in, I had moved from one position to another like I was on the first floor working with a side by side with the director of nursing. There, our offices were right together. And then this position came open, and I was the one responsible for how, uh, interviewing all of the people that got jobs there. Mm -hmm. So when this job of uh, coordination of, of discharge planning came, I, I applied for it <laughs> and ended up getting it, you know. And then that's when the lady that the nurses that were in the department, I was the only person of, of color in the whole hospital. I was only in RN the in the whole hospital. Wow. Lincoln General Hospital. There was one LPN and one RN, me. Oh my goodness. That's right. Only one, how could that be? But in Nebraska, that was. Well, that, you know, keeps you humble because you know that you don't deserve it. And everybody that was came in my office, I had a guy that was cleaning the floors who was from Africa, who was a, a PhD. Because he oh, couldn't, clean the floors. couldn't, you know, they wouldn't accept his education. Oh. I mean, the nicest guy, you know, really. And we became friends. <laughs> he was so nice. And I know, you know, things like that happen to people like that. They come to the states and they have this education and then they won't let them serve in those positions. And he was cleaning halls and mopping floors and stuff. With a PhD? With a PhD. Yeah. It's just not, it's not right in Nebraska. In fact, Nebraska's blacks were so scarce when we first came, that when you saw one downtown, you wanted to run up and hug him. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. true. Because it was, uh, it was scared, like scared as hen's teeth, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It is true. And when we came, like it was 134,000 people here in Lincoln. Of course, it's almost 300,000 now, but at that time, we, we were scarce. <laughs> yes. So when you'd see one downtown, in fact, one, one week in, we were downtown, like on a Friday. We don't usually go to town on Friday because we lived 13 miles out from Lincoln where my husband and I had built a house and had moved into it. He, he had always wanted to build 
our own house because he was a carpenter and came from school and he wanted to do that. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there was so, so much, so many things happened. But anyway, he, uh, we were downtown uh, on a Friday and this black guy walked up to us. We were getting ready to get into our car and he wanted to ask us uh, where was a barber shop. He needed to have, get a haircut. And Dad said, well, that's where I'm going. You know, I'm going. He said, I'll take you. Come on. He hopped in the car, and we introduced ourselves and found out that he was a big wig from the conference from Washington that came down to Nebraska. We didn't even know he was an, an Adventist. Till he got in the car and said who he was, A.V. Pinkney, he said, and that he uh, had brought a young man for a temperance contest, he said. Oh. And uh, he, he wanted him to be away from the group because he didn't want him to mingle with, with the rest of them. And so we lived out from Lincoln then, so we invited him to dinner, he and the young man. And uh, <coughs> Didn't, didn't know he was the Adventist, but we found out. <laughs> and that took him out there, and he didn't want him to mingle with the others. That All the schools were represented, you know, one person from each school. Mm -hmm. He said, because his guy was going to win. So we had him for dinner. And that, it was out to the college, Union College Auditorium, and, and they had about seven to eight folks. And they all took uh, turns, at, drew straws as to who was going to be first. And they said to them that, you know, we got all these people that's students and we want to be fair and right. We, one, only one thing we ask, he told the audience, is that you don't, you hold your applause until everybody has, you know, made their presentation. That's what he said. And everybody agreed. <clears throat> Our young man, I think he was about the fourth. The only problem was that <clears throat> when he made his presentation, <clears throat> that was it. They didn't hear nothing else. Oh, really? Mm -mm. They broke out into the pause. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. They did. There's some white folks, too. He won. <laughs> he did four. <laughs> You know, he was about the fourth one, and they listened to the others, but he came through. Wow. Yes, he did. He won. Yes, he did. He young. Yes, he was a big wig with a, a nice-looking young man. In fact, Dad took a picture of him, the two of them took together. And, uh, yeah, he, he won. The Lord is something else. The Lord is no respecter of persons. <laughs> You're certainly right about that. And you know, and for our people, he has really opened doors for us that you never thought would ever open. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I'm not saying anything against white people because my best friends are white, you know, because color doesn't matter to me, yes. you know, really. And so, but God just, he is a person that likes diversity. That's right. And that's what he does. He mix, mixes us up. You know, that's how come we got mixed. You know, we came from Africa and ended up getting mixed because that's what God wants. Yes, that's right. You know, we're all the same, one blood. That's right. And he just goes before you and straightens it out. And things that they want to do you harm, but they end up being a blessing. Yes. That's what it's all about. Well, tell me, um, tell our audience about the experience you told me on the phone about um, someone at the job at the hospital was upset that you were in this position. So tell, tell our audience what happened. Well, they put me in charge of uh, this department for first person of color because I was the only our, uh, person of color in the hospital our in. And they, um, the people that were in the department didn't want a person of color over them, so they decided to quit 
you know, walk out and transfer out in the hospital somewhere else. So <laughs> the whole department quit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they didn't didn't want me to be, you know, their boss. So I did nothing to do it to deserve it. You know, I was fair and tried to be friends. They would not be friends. Um, oh, they were. You could you know you could tell it in their eyes. Mm. With the hate that they had in their eyes, eyes. So they walked away. But the administrator of the hospital knew me personally. Uh, we uh, went to parties and things together. You know, they would invite my husband and I to their parties, and we would socialize with with the big wigs. How it was funny, but anyway. <laughs> This lady left, and her the others that were in the department left, and then she decided, well, I'm not going to let her run me away from this hospital, you know. All of this was told to me afterwards. Okay. So she came back to get her job back. And the administrator of the hospital told her, well, we, we understand you probably, you know, would want to come back, but we don't need people like you here. Uh -uh. Sorry. <laughs> she walked away and they didn't want her to come back. They told her, no, no, thank you. Said, we know Mrs. Graham and she's not like that at all. Because we socialized together and worked together. And you know, my office was next to the director of nursing office. We were all together. Mm -hmm. And they knew what they knew me. Yes. So your character really yeah. made the way for That's you. Right. You you didn't change who no. you were. No, I didn't. Just you know. But some people have things in their heart, and you know when they saw me come in as their supervisor, they didn't like it, and they said, "Well, you know, I don't have to take this. Oh, I just." quit. <laughs> and then when they wanted to come back, they said, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and your supervisor, your the director was white, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? I'm the only black. And you're the only black. Yes. Already in the whole hospital. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. That's just so hard for me to believe. Well, wow. that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. This Lincoln General Hospital. One LPN, black LPN, and one black RN. Two of us in the hospital of 250 people, uh, you know, bed, bed, hospital. Oh, yeah, it really happened. And you told me on the phone also that I know you're trying to be humble, but I'm going to tell the truth. You blazed a way for other black nurses and, and well, yeah. employees. Yeah, whenever you, you're the first, you are opening doors. Yes. No matter what. I mean, even Keith has positions that he's helped and was the only one. And after he quit and left, they hired other people of color. Yeah, that does happen. That's what happens is that those that come on after us and we have, you know, made a good impression they will hire others because they assume that they're like that. And they may not necessarily be like that, but it does open the door yes. for others, which is a real blessing for those of us that uh, became the first. And many of us, we have become to be, you know, to be the first of whatever positions that we're, uh, you know, working in. And then they find out that we are like everybody else, and they become our friends. Yeah, we 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 become friends because when I worked at a, a doctor's office here in Lincoln, um, I was uh, <laughs> the only. Uh, I, there were you know, we we didn't work you know in a doctor's office. You have the people that work up front. Mm -hmm. The receptionist and the person, the bookkeeper and the people up front, and then we worked in the back. And we were uh, the uh, nurses back there and then the doctor, you know, 
uh, in with the patients and stuff, and we did everything, you know, did all kinds of things, taking x-rays and this and that, and drawing blood and whatever was necessary needed, but this, uh, yeah, I had an opportunity to work for, for doctors here too, besides working in, uh, in the hospital, Lincoln General. Uh, Brian's uh, director of earth nurses asked me to come and work there, but Brian was a kind of a snippy, you know, all the LPNs together and the one bed and the RENs together and, and I didn't like that. You mm -hmm. know, I, I figured we were all nurses. We, we should be, you know, so when she asked me when I worked there, I told her I think about it, but I really didn't think about it really. But I went to Lincoln General instead where people were a lot friendlier, friendly mm -hmm. and nice. You know, there. That's where I really wanted to work and ended up holding some responsible positions there. And of course, being in Nebraska, you're almost going to be the only one. You're going to be opening doors for, for others. And when you do, then the others step in. It's a real blessing. It's a very, it's a real blessing. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I want you to tell me one more story. Um, you mentioned about your husband, um, and he became a carpenter and a builder. And he had an ex well, he had several experiences, but one of the experiences turned out really to be a great one. <laughs> it started out not so great, <laughs> then it became great. So, can you share that with us? Okay, let's see. When he came here and wanted to get a job as a carpenter, they told him, I'm sorry, we can't hire you as a carpenter. We'll hire you as a laborer. And uh, the whites that came in that had never been to school for their you know, trade, they were hired you know, as, as carpenters, even though they had received on the job you know, training. But he had gone to school and, and learned how to build and remodel, and the work that he did was fantastic, just beautiful. So, uh, yeah, he uh, was told that they didn't hire blacks as carpenters, so, so he had to start uh, digging holes. And, uh, and they were, he, he was with this company that put up a manufactured houses so they would uh, dig holes and uh, put these uh, cement in the holes and the house would go on top. Mm -hmm. So he had one experience, he had a lot of experiences with them. In fact, the guy that hired him for the job, he only got it because of a friend that uh, was a, uh, his name is Faulkner, and in, in fact, you, when you go to the Lincoln Journal, you'll see his name. And uh, Dad's uh, sister-in-law worked for Mr. Falk Faulkner. He was very wealthy. He owned the insurance company, so uh, he he got that job because uh, they asked him to you know to try him you know to take him on. So he got that job. He only worked about eight months, but uh, the Lord blessed him on that job. He, he was responsible for, they didn't hire him as a carpenter, but a laborer, and he was responsible for digging holes <clears throat> like this was the, the house. So they would put it on, you know, they had to dig holes so far apart. And here and there and all around where the house would sit, sit on to, was manufactured houses. Mm -hmm. So he was responsible for doing that. He took the job. He says, as long as it's honest, I'll take the job. But I won't do anything dishonest. But, you know, he, he worked as a carpenter. He said, I got a wife and a family, and whatever it takes, I'll do it. So he did that. 
So one day he was on the job and the FHA people have to come by and approve the uh, portions that are being done, each step that you do. So the FHA uh, guy from uh, Federal Housing Administration came by to uh, check to see whether or not they were doing the work right. <coughs> he, <coughs> he went around and checked all the holes and he got to the hole where my husband was doing. <coughs> and my husband, of course, had been to school and he knew that when you're setting something on a foundation that you can't have a it like this. Can't set a house on a foundation like that. Mm -hmm. It's got to be at the bottom where it's a flange, you know, cement flange. Yes. You just can't have it sitting there like that because it's going to fall. So the holes that he dug, he had made a stick with some springs on it. So when you put down into the hole, you turn it around, and of course it's a flange. Mm -hmm. But the other people, when they built their holes and, and, and the FHA guy came to check them, they were all straight. <laughs> and the FHA guy told, when he got to dad's hole, he told the supervisor there, this man, the holes here and they are right. The rest of them could have to be done over. Oh, They're not right. That's right. <laughs> Had to be done over because you you can't set a house on a like that. Yes. You know it's got to have a thing around it, and none of them had done it. Of course, they didn't like that. But. <laughs> of course, they didn't. <laughs> yeah. None of them. Yeah. But your husband had been trained. Yes, he he had been trained. <laughs> oh, I tell you, he was the only person of color there too. So. <laughs> he he experienced a lot of discrimination. He really did. But some who didn't know that he was black, see, he, he didn't look like the average black man, so they figured he was something else. So, you know, they would try to, he said, I'm not going to deny my race in order to to get a job or whatever. I am what I am. And... <laughs> If he had faked an accent or whatever, he could have gotten away with it. But he said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh -uh. No. Because he had integrity. That's right. Yeah. No, he wanted to do things that were right. Nothing under the, the table. And the Lord blessed. Because when we came here to N Nebraska, we had nothing. Zero. Well, we had one child. <laughs> but other than that, we didn't have anything. <laughs> Didn't have anything. So you're starting from scratch. Scratch. You better believe it. In a little room, one room with a, that was a, a bedroom. And we had one room, had a, shared a kitchen with another family. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's right. And in the living room of this place, because we were downstairs, they were upstairs. No, we, we shared the bathroom with them, not the kitchen, but the bathroom. So it was a one-story house, and they would make it into a two-story, but it wasn't. It was one. We slept downstairs. They slept upstairs. The bathroom was upstairs. <laughs> the first week we were staying there, we had a baby. Mill, Mill was our youngest. We were up all night catching mice. Oh my. And he would put them in the little uh, baby jars. Put oh. the mice in baby jars. That's right. Mice running around and we weren't used oh. to that. That was not what we wanted. No. This is terrible. And on the seal, he had set them on the seal. <laughs> oh the my. Mice in the jars. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and people um uh, when they see that you've accomplished something, that you're living in a nice place or whatever, they think that it's always been like that. We, we started from nothing. Scratch. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't you, always like that. 
Yes. And then I had even somebody to tell me one time, you don't know what it is to be hungry, or you don't know what it is to be. I've been there. You know, like we had a Thanksgiving, and all we had was soup. Thanksgiving, we did you know didn't have a turkey or nothing. Even when we were eating meat, we didn't have meat. <laughs> we couldn't afford. It. <laughs> so you know what it's like uh, to be. I know what it's like poor, hungry. That's right, <laughs> and that is the reason why. You know, you see people in need. We're supposed to help. We're supposed to do what we can to help others. You're not supposed to be sitting there with your plate full and your <laughs> neighbor sitting across with the empty plate. Uh -uh. That's, That's not what it's all about. <laughs> I'm kind of funny, but it's true. <laughs> That's right. Uh, your husband, you had told me on the phone that he had a supervisor who didn't like him very much. <laughs> <laughs> and he had not been kind to him. That's right. And then, what happened 10 years later? Okay, yeah, this supervisor was the one that cursed him out and told him, if you don't like it, you can leave. He thought about his wife and child. He kept his mouth shut, he didn't say a word. He went on. Even though he was being That's treated right. poorly. He kept his mind, kept on working until the job closed, closed down. <clears throat> and so um, after he, you know, uh, this happened some years later, and it was at least a lot, at least ten years later that he had uh, decided to. He was working for a company before that here um, in Lincoln was a metal company that they handled all the metals, and it was a a place that was so hot, like eighteen hundred degrees that he had to shower every day before he came home because it was such a dirty place and hot place. The metal would sometimes spew out of the, oh. you know, uh, pot mm -hmm. and he had burns on his back from running because it hit that cloth and right through to your skin. And so he had burns around this, uh, where the metal was getting into his shoe, trying to get to his school, uh, Shoes, so he had gotten burned there, uh, but he said, "I'm, I, I hated for him to be at that job, and wanted him to leave." He said, "I'm not leaving until the Lord tells me to leave, because I got a family and I have to, to take care of the family." You just don't find men like that anymore. That are willing to do whatever it takes, honest, to make a living, because he really didn't want me out working. Mm -hmm. You know, but I was out working, cleaning houses, doing housework. Oh yeah. This was before you became. No, it's here in Lincoln. Here, okay. Yeah, here in Lincoln. I did it in in uh, Kentucky too. Four dollars a day. I worked eight hours for four dollars. Four dollars a day. And car fare, twenty five cents car fare. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Four dollars for eight hours of work and oh twenty-five God. cents the bus <laughs> to take the bus back and forth. Uh, that's right. So you just made three fifty. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you did just like your husband. You did what you needed to do. That's right. You do what you need to do mm -hmm. at the time. Anything honest. We had to make a living because we got our hair to Nebraska. Following his, his brother and his wife, they said, you ought to come out to Nebraska. You can work anywhere, you can do anything. And they said it would be better than Kentucky. We came out here and ran into prejudice like that. We thought we were coming from the South, which was, you know, segregated. But we came out here and it was terrible out here. Oh my. Because they didn't have but a few people of color. And the um, housework and, and all the lower jobs like that were held by the Russians and other people from Europe. They held all those cleaning positions and jobs and stuff. So when we come out, we take in their, their work. 
<laughs> away from them. And they get out and do cleaning sidewalks and stuff. I mean, they really clean. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's terrible. Yeah. It's funny in a way, but it wasn't funny then. I, no, I'm I'll sure tell you not. for sure. <laughs> but you do what you have to do. That's honest. And you're faithful to God with your tithe and your offering. And, he, and he's promised to open up the windows. He definitely opens up the windows. Absolutely. When you're faithful, he takes care of your needs. You better believe it. No matter the circumstances. Huh? No matter the circumstances. That's right, no matter the circumstances. Yeah, that we have always been faithful in, in our tithe and our offering because he promised he would open up the windows and he, he does. And you wonder why windows? There are more windows than doors. That's beautiful. Yes, he opens the windows. There's more windows than doors. That's what he does. He definitely does. Yeah, you know, even when we would take little trips or vacations, we would uh, leave our money and our tithe envelope home. In fact, once a week we did it and somebody stole it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah, somebody stole it. But we just keep on being faithful because we know God takes care of his own. You know, he's allowed us to uh, send the kids to church school and send a lot, those many kids to church school. <laughs> it was always high. <laughs> it was, I'm sure, quite expensive to do yeah, that. But. Yeah, but we wanted them to have a Christian education. In fact, one of them became a missionary overseas from Union College. Yeah, he did. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell us the, the tail end of that story. So the job ended. Your husband had this job. He wasn't treated very nicely by the supervisor. And then what happened 10 years later? Okay, he finally had gone into business for himself and was uh, working at this house and saw this man when he went to the house to do some, some work, he forgot something. He went back to his truck to get his stuff. And this guy on the porch next door, on the swing on the porch, walked up to him. The guy was a big guy, like six foot high. And high. And my husband was short, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said to him, do you remember me? And my husband looked at him. <laughs> So yeah, I remember you. He was the one that cussed him out. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I want to tell you, I want to apologize to you for, he says, because you did nothing. I cursed you out. You did nothing to cause me to do that. And see, had my husband cursed him back, wouldn't have been nothing. But this guy was sitting on the porch every day. He was sick then, yet not willing, you're not able to work. But he recognized him because he's short, so everybody recognized my husband. <laughs> and I went up to him and apologized to him and asked him, will you please accept my apology? My husband said, of course. He certainly did, and he shook hands. Yes, that was, that was very nice because, uh, you know, they say that all of our black folks are are young, when you're young and black, you're gonna get upset and you know, do your thing, but nope, he didn't. And as a result, uh, he uh, accepted his apology. Yes, he did. And that actually, that actually happened. And I'm so glad that there are two things we can learn. Your husband didn't change who he was. That's right. He was a hard worker and he was gonna continue to be a hard worker no matter how he was being treated. And then on the other side, the supervisor, could recognize where he had gone wrong, and he apologized, so it tells us that people can change. Yes, yes, people can change, yeah, because uh, a lot of times when he started out to do you know, business for himself, <clears throat> and they would let him work in the uh, basement first, you know, go down to the basement and do something first. And then when they found out his work was so good, of course, the, and the word of mouth started going around, and before you know it, he had more work than he could do. 
and he became the largest uh, minority contractor in Lincoln in this area. And you said that yeah. he, along with Bernie Sapu's husband, yeah. I believe, yeah, yeah, they were on TV. That's right. They, oh yes, right. and um, yeah, they were. We were on TV, and uh, yeah, we were. We were at a oh thing with all the uh, contractors uh, and their um, staff. We, uh, in fact, uh, Alma Fogel Yard. She, I remember her. She, she had us in that citywide uh, thing that they were honoring all of the minorities. You know how they try to do. This is Black History Week month, and so here, honor the minorities. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that happened at the governor's mansion, right? Yeah, yeah, it did. Yes, it did. And her husband had a company called uh, Cameroon or something. Bernice did. Back at, not too long ago, I showed Bernice that picture of, of us, and she laughed. She remembers. Yeah, he used to be a contractor too. Mm -hmm. We were the only two, I think, here in the Lincoln. Well, Elder Graham, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share with us your experiences and um, to show all of us just how good God is and no matter what circumstances you might be in God can work through those things and God can work through you you just continue to show the light of God and God will honor that that's true he does is there anything any parting words you want to say well I am just thankful to God for all of the blessings that he's constantly bestows upon us he is no respecter of person. And it goes to show that he just doesn't love a few people. He loves everybody, which is an example of how we should live and love. Yes. You know, love people, period. Because we're all the same blood, so there's no reason why that we shouldn't be um, like him and to love the way that he loves. And he does be, go before us and prepares our way. And even when we're not even thinking about the blessings, he's blessing us and taking care of us. And we should be forever grateful and thankful because honestly, he is an awesome God. Yes, he <laughs> is. Yes, he is. He's awesome. <laughs> that song that you guys sing about being awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he is awesome. He is awesome. I totally really is. agree. Well, thank you so much, and um, we will see you guys later. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>